Hi, my name is Paulina and I'm with the New Jersey Hope and Healing Program. Um, this webinar is called Post-Quarantine Social Anxiety, and I'm going to be talking about social anxiety symptoms and common ways to treat and deal with these kinds of difficulties. And this is especially relevant for our post-quarantine world where maybe we're getting back into settings where there are a lot of people or a lot more socializing than we've been used to. And that might make our social anxiety feel worse than it has been, or you might be feeling a new sense of anxiety that you haven't felt before. Either way, hopefully this webinar will give you some tools to help work through whatever's coming up for you in this moment. So um, on this slide, we have the formal criteria for social anxiety, um, which is a formal disorder in the DSM. Um, and I'm sharing this criteria because it is helpful to know what we're talking about and referencing, but just because you don't meet full criteria for social anxiety doesn't mean that you can't benefit from the same tools that help people who do have full-blown clinical social anxiety. So um, you might fall anywhere on a spectrum of severity with these kinds of experiences, but hopefully this is still all relevant. So first, of course, people who have social anxiety are anxious about and fearful of certain kinds of social situations. It might be one specific social situation like public speaking, or you might feel pretty generally uncomfortable in social situations where you're meeting new people or having conversations. And most of the time, people who have social anxiety, the thing that is very scary about these situations is feeling like you're going to be negatively evaluated. So that might mean I'm worried about being embarrassed when I meet a new person and maybe I slip over my words or something like that, or I don't know how to have a smooth, you know, first small talk conversation. Or you might feel like, you know, I'm going into this work presentation and I'm going to mess up and I'm not going to look competent, things like that. And because of those fears, people who have social anxiety usually avoid um, at all costs, the things that provoke anxiety in them in those situations, or if you have to be in those situations and can't escape them, they're really uncomfortable and anxiety provoking to be in. And although the experience and emotion of anxiety and discomfort is very real when you have social anxiety, the actual threat of these situations is not totally in proportion to the way a person might be feeling about them, right? Because of course we all maybe have embarrassing social interactions and we all live and, and move on. And usually we can all you know, have friends and connections even if we're not perfectly wonderful conversationalists, right? But for someone who has social anxiety, these kinds of fears and the worst case scenarios that are in their minds are really debilitating and, and barriers for them for putting themselves out there. And um, social anxiety that does meet clinical criteria has to have lasted for a certain length um, of six months or more. So it has to be, you know, kind of here to stay a long term problem. And it also has to cause clinically significant distress or impairment, which just means that it has to be serious enough, right? That you feel really bad, you're not able to thrive or function in the way you want to, whether that's with family or friends or at work, things like that are disrupted by your social anxiety. So you might wanna reflect yourself now, like where are you on a spectrum of social anxiety? Do you feel some of these things some of the time or do you feel a lot of these things most of the time? Um, how has it been for you since maybe returning to work or school or seeing friends again? Have, have these things felt harder than they usually do? So just take a moment to think about that for yourself. And now I'm going to go into the common treatments used for social anxiety, which the evidence-based and, and most common treatment is exposure therapy. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the rationale and how it works so that you can understand maybe why you might want to use some of these techniques in your own life. So um, the picture here is people watching a scary movie. And this is gonna be the analogy we use to explain how exposure therapy works. So if you watch a scary movie for the first time, you might react like these folks are, you might be very scared, you might jump out of your chair and, and scream when you see something on the screen pop out at you. And it's, it's a pretty emotionally intense and scary experience. 
But if you were to watch the same movie over again the next day and then again the following day, you'd probably notice yourself feeling much less scared and reactive and jumpy when you were watching those same scenes. You know what's coming, you know what it's gonna feel like. And so your body just doesn't have the same kind of strong reaction. And that's the same concept with exposure therapy where um, a therapist and a client would identify certain kinds of social situations that a person is really worried about and would actually try them out and keep going through these situations until they're no longer so scary for a person. And that's a process called habituation where we're no longer strongly associating fear um, and arousal, right? Like emotional um, intensity or physiological intensity with the same thing that used to make us really anxious. So over time, like that connection to a new conversation being scary is weakened because we've had so many new conversations and we've seen that we've survived them and it's been okay. And this can make people feel, first of all, free of that same strong dread and fear that they once had towards that thing that they've been exposed to now. And it can also help them feel really self-efficacious because exposure therapy is all about empowerment and people being able to face the things that they typically are kind of at the mercy of, right? If your whole life is about avoiding something scary, but now you're able to just face that thing, that can be something that feels really empowering for people. And emotion processing is something that also is at work here in treating social anxiety because the emotions and experiences that come up around socializing that are so uncomfortable, you know, they have to come up in exposure therapy and they come into the light of day, they run their course, people are confronted with, you know, let me deal with this feeling and this emotion. And then again, it's not so powerful at that point if people are able to really experience and work through the emotions that are difficult that might have come up around their social anxiety. So this is the treatment that many clinicians might use with a client coming in for social anxiety. But what's great about um, exposure therapy is how easy it is to try on your own with certain things especially with social anxiety. So there are a lot of different ways that you can throw yourself into social situations, especially the ones that might make you particularly nervous, and you can practice going through them until they become less intimidating. So here are all of these different kinds of social situations that you could simulate, like talking to strangers through online forums, um, practicing being public and in the center of attention by joining a virtual dance party, practicing making mistakes by putting a typo in an email, talking to romantic partners on these different platforms. And the most important thing when you're trying these things is to not avoid them, right? If they're not going well, or if you start to get worried, just get through them, right? That's basically the beauty of exposure is you don't have to have a great interaction with a romantic partner. You don't have to form a best friend on an online platform, but as long as you try it, you do it and you get through it and you're on the other side, usually your anxiety will go down. Avoiding these things only reinforces to yourself that they should be avoided and they're scary, right? So these are all ways for us to just throw ourselves into social situations get really used to being out there and vulnerable. And then these kinds of things when we're returning into in-person world and interactions hopefully are less scary and daunting. So hopefully that was helpful no matter you know how much you struggle with social anxiety. Hopefully you've got some ideas about how to really expand your comfort zone by putting yourself out there in different ways and kind of empowering yourself, even if you don't have a therapist or access to therapy or treatment for social anxiety that you can be working on this on your own as well. And this page has other resources if you're looking for any other kinds of help, particularly related to the pandemic. So the New Jersey Hope and Healing Program, we provide lots of different options like crisis counseling, webinars, referrals to other resources, and if you're interested in anything like that, you can contact us at our website or email that's listed there. And if you're specifically interested in um, content that's uh, related to frontline workers like nurses or teachers, things like that, 
you can follow that Instagram page and see more content there that has been developed for that population. So again, hopefully this was somewhat helpful and I appreciate your time today and I hope you have a great day.